Hi everyone, welcome to Autism BC Talks about Occupational Therapy today with Jen Tabense of Breaking Trail OT. We're lucky to have her today to explain and describe what an occupational therapist does and how they can help um, your child, your loved one, or yourself. So uh, thank you, Jen, for being with us here today. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. This is really exciting. Um, I love talking about OT, so... Anytime anyone wants to hear, just give me a shout. Um, occupational therapists look at occupations, which really means how we occupy our time. So all those activities we do during the day. Um, the cool thing about occupations are that it affects our health and our well-being. So what we do every day, you know, makes us happy, makes us healthy, or it doesn't, or maybe it's neutral. Most people, you know, we have some in both categories. So OTs are healthcare professionals looking to help you figure out what's meaningful, what are those helpful activities, which ones maybe aren't so helpful, but we still want to do. That's totally okay. Um, we're not here to judge or say how, just letting you know your balance. And um, when we're working with kids, like we do at Breaking Trail, um, development is a big part of kids' health. So that's where a lot of our skill building comes in as well. So we'll look at the environment and how it interacts. So that's our sensory systems, that's, you know, using visuals, all those kind of things. The activity itself, can we make it harder? Can we make it easier? Can we add dinosaurs so it's super fun? Um, and then the actual skills and strategies to help um, kids and their families kind of learn um, different ways of approaching something so that it uses their strengths instead of the things that are super hard. So they can do more and what they want. <laughs> awesome, thank you for explaining that, Jen. Can an occupational therapist help with fine motor skills such as um, we hear often families or parents or loved ones that are struggling with dressing, um, using utensils, how can you do that and are those skill sets you can work on? Yes, um, OTs be, are usually called in for fine motor and um, a lot of the time it's more than just how these work. Right, so it's our thinking around things, it's our planning, it's maybe the fear of trying it. So, especially with tying shoes, we'll go in to work on the fine motor of tying shoes and it's actually that motor planning piece because before we tied shoes, we built the most intricate Lego kit ever. So we know there's great strength in the fingers, but there's just something, maybe it was a fear, maybe it was an uncertainty, or maybe it was just tying shoes is like 10 steps. There's a lot of looping and bunny rabbits and pulling and switching hands. So trying to figure out what the piece is that is actually the hindrance. And sometimes it is fine motor. And then we get to do cool activities like Lego building and playing with Play-Doh and clay to build up those hand strength. But usually if a parent hasn't been able to figure out how to boost that, hand, that fine motor, there's more pieces to it. What about gross motor skills? Um, sometimes parents ask us like, my child doesn't know how to ride a bike. What can you do? So we will break down any kind of task. So in this case, a gross motor task. In biking, there's community safety pieces. There's the actual coordinating your leg movements. There's the balance component. So we'll work on that. But another piece is the family readiness for their kid to be able to ride a bike. Because as soon as they're on that, they're gone. Do we have a bike for the adult? Do we have a scooter? Like, how are we going to stay together as a group? That community safety mindset, all those pieces. So I think when we OT support with gross motor, we're looking at the whole activity. So when we're at the playground, not only are we working on going up the stairs and going down the slide, we're also gonna look at our ability to navigate when there's another kid on the stairs. How do we go around them? Or do we ask them to move? What's our skill level and how can we advocate for ourselves to get where we need to go? Or do we say, oh, I can wait and that's okay. Depends on the kid. So um, playgrounds is a great place for OTs. Um, stairs in the house is always a thing um, that some kids struggle with. And um, we really want to, because of the health mindset OTs bring, we really want to make sure kids are aware of how to move their body physically because we need that for our baseline regulation, for our physical health ongoing. Everyone knows exercise is good for us. But if we don't have the skills to do it, I wouldn't want to go play hockey if I didn't know how to skate. Right. So even though I love hockey, I'm not going to go twice a week and get my cardio in if I don't know how to skate. So that's how OTs help. It's more than just learning left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg. It's about the whole picture so that they can engage in those occupations. Can you help someone with selective eating? 
yes and maybe. So when you're choosing an OT, um, the first thing we're going to do is figure out how selective the eating is because sometimes there are pieces that we need to get cleared by medical or um, really specialist uh, in feeding. Uh, OTs at Breaking Trail, we are generalists, um, but do have extra training in feeding sections. So we have to make sure that we're the right fit for you. And then it's totally customized, but a lot of the approach we like to take is a play-based. Can you tell me what executive functioning is? We hear that term a lot, um, but what actually is executive functioning? Okay, so executive functioning is our ability to juggle. I have a prop. <laughs> it's juggling our thinking, our feeling, and our actions. So there's a lot of skills incorporated in that and concepts like planning, regulation, um, starting a task, sustaining our attention in a task, knowing when it's done. So it's pretty complicated. Um, but if we can think about it of, as executing the thinking portions, the feeling portions, and the actions of a task, all at the same time. That's where executive functioning comes in. How can an OT help with executive functioning? Well, back to this wonderful board here. What we do is whatever the challenge area is, like getting ready in the morning, we want to break it down into those pieces. So the thinking tasks, well, they've been working on this for a really long time. So maybe the thinking's only a little bit because they know how to brush their teeth. They know the order. We've been practicing that a lot. But maybe it's a pretty stressful time for them because they've been, you know, get in trouble for being late or they're really um, susceptible to time pressure. So maybe that one's really high on school days and really low on weekends. So we'll say it's a school day. And then the actions. Maybe, you know, we're still working on getting dressed. Maybe we're working on that teeth brushing. And this is where sensory can kind of come in too. Maybe it's a really uncomfortable feeling to wash our face in the morning. So that can add to the feelings pile or the actions pile, depending on the kid. So what we do is we look and say, oh, that task is a little bit too hard for first thing in the morning because that's not the best time of day for this person. So what we do is we try and figure out, hmm, where can we make the task easier? So maybe laying the clothes out the night before, super basic starter one, right? But now we don't have to open that drawer and sort through all the stuff. It's already there, right? And we know what we're wearing and we're kind of excited about those clothes maybe. Bring that feeling down. Or that sensory component, that's my comfiest shirt because we know Mondays are the hardest going from weekend to, to school days. Let's go with the comfy socks too. So what we do is we try to lower demands where we can um, and realize that, no, nope, this is always going to be a hard one. So we only have space to juggle these two. So how can we most support? And then it goes into picking our battles because we can't make every task super easy and feeling else we'll never build skills here. But when we're working on a tough feelings one, let's not make it a tough actions one as well. Right? So let's make that one easier. I love that response because as a mom myself, I know how hard it is to get out of the house in the morning sometimes. And we hear that all the time from families that the mornings and the bedtime routine Teens are often the toughest. So thanks for that explanation. A term I've heard a lot lately is resiliency building. What is that? Yeah, great question. So resilience is our ability to bounce back when we face an obstacle. And these obstacles are sometimes expected, like maybe changing from your primary school to your high school or um, something you know is coming, a job change, a move. And it's also those unexpected things that come in and kind of out of nowhere. So it's our ability to navigate that obstacle or that challenge. How do we, after it happens, are we learning from it and moving on? Are we able to go back to our life or are we kind of stuck in that, oh man, I'm overwhelmed mode? And how we build resiliency is what we do every day. So it's a lot of the things that we heard of, you know, are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting your basic needs met? Are you having food? Are you doing those things that make you feel like you? Um, so what we like to focus on are what are those, how do you find meaning in your everyday activities? And how do you prioritize what you value and what is good for you? When you have way too many things to do in a day, how do we either add meaning, meaning to things that you're already doing or extra like relaxation or extra energy boosting or whatever it may be um, in what you're already doing? Or how do we tweak the schedule or your approach to your day so that you make time and space for the things you need? Can you tell me about your caregiver resiliency group that you're running right now? Yeah, so we've run it in person and with all the 
difficulties with that right now, we are doing it virtually now. So it's super exciting because it's more accessible to as many people that need it right now. Um, and it really focuses on not only activities, we get to try out a bunch of stuff to see what actually works for you. Because sometimes when we're in a slump, we don't even know how to make ourselves feel better because we haven't thought about that in a really long time. We just know that we don't feel good. Um, so what might work for you? But then actually, how are you going to do it? Because not much of this is rocket science, right? We know eating's important, sleeping's important, but how do we do those things? So that's really what we look at is what do we need to do? How do we do it? And why? Why are we doing it? So that's why this group dynamic is awesome. And um, we're just so excited about it. We've got some great feedback about the first round. So putting it to virtual where it's accessible to more people is super exciting. Sounds really cool. And this is for any caregiver, not just moms, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Caregivers, this could be grandma, this could be an auntie, this could be dad, this could be um, siblings. Great. Awesome. Can an adult benefit from the services of an occupational therapist? Yes, and many do. So a lot of times your um, adult COTs after an accident or um, something along the um, like an incident or a moment in time, whether it's a health crisis or something like that. Um, but now more and more adults are seeking out for executive functioning um, support, which is really interesting because they're noticing a late diagnosis of ADHD or things that were working. There's just too many demands in the world right now. So we need better systems. Um, and that's something that I think is so cool in our profession. Um, Breaking Trail OT has really noticed a gap in our clients that kind of had funding up until they're 18, 19, and then services really work well for them when they're 25 to 30. So kind of that gap in that transition time, which is when we need the most supports when things are changing and um, there's a huge piece of development there in our young adult, adult life. So we are working on a group um, to try to support those uh, occupations of being a young adult of growing up. Um, so hopefully that will be coming out this spring, but right now we do take a uh, case by case um, with young adults. Um, so if anyone's looking for support with their like 18 to 25 year old, uh, feel free to let us know. And then if you are an adult that's looking for some OT support, you can always reach out and we can refer you to um, a clinic or a provider that would be um, able to meet your needs or what you're looking for, get you started. Thanks, Jen, for all the information today about occupational therapy. It's been super helpful. And wondering how can people reach out to you if they have more questions, if they want to learn more about the Virtual Caregiver Resiliency Group, or they just want to explore more about occupational therapy? Thanks, Lisa. Um, they can reach out to us by checking out our website, www.breakingtrailot.ca. It's Canadian.ca, <laughs> um, or you can email me um, or uh, give our office a call. And I think our number is going to pop up on the screen. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we should know that you are located in Kelowna, but you do virtual services as well. So oh, and yes, you've got virtual and we um, do quite a bit of travel. So there are travel fees outside of West Kelowna and Lake Country, but um, case by case, we will do some traveling to come support you if you need. But yeah, virtual is a great option. Wonderful. Thanks for explaining to us um, a little bit about what an OT does and how they can help someone. And um, especially with the first steps after a diagnosis, a lot of parents don't know what an occupational does. So this has been really helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great day.